Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our alternative view or simply out view. At our view, we chat with industry leaders to get to know them, their opinions and also insights. Uh, meanwhile, we want to hear about their popular and popular brand new or alternative views or anything in between. Yeah, I'm your host, Yao Qi from our layer and elastic execution layer on Ethereum for Web3. And uh, today it's our uh, great honor to have our guest, uh, Nicholas. He's working with consensus and uh, mainly leading the team to deliver the eco, uh, to deliver the ZK EVM at the consensus, which is sort of like an EVM equivalent uh, rollup to Ethereum. So yeah, then uh, Nicholas, can you tell us more about yourself and uh, what kind of stuff you're working on at the moment? Yes, hello everyone, thanks for having me. So I'm Nicolas Lyochon, I'm responsible for r and Consensus, which is actually an applied research team. Our responsibility is to solve or contribute solving the problems that are on the path of the web free world. That's basically our mission. And we work actually on many different topics, uh, the Ethereum protocol itself, where we contributed, for example, a lot uh, to proof of stake and to the and to the merge. We work as well on bridges and cross chains. And question is, can we make bridges safe? What should be done? How can we make things better? We work a lot as well on formal methods. We work, for example, on formally verifying the Ethereum protocol. This is something that we're doing with the Ethereum Foundation. So we identify properties and we prove that their properties are met or not met. We work as well on formal methods on the smart contract verification. We want mm -hmm. to make smart contracts safer. So we have a team that is identifying all the different ways of proving smart contracts, uh, giving tools to developers uh, so they will be able to write better smart contracts. So this is a work in progress, but we hope to have very interesting results soon. And we contributed recently, actually, uh, the EVM specification in Daphne, so it can be used as a tool to verify the correctness of execution at the bytecode level. We work as well on cryptography, and we're getting closer to rollups when we when I'm saying this. On cryptography, we contribute a library called GNARK that allows you to write uh, zero knowledge circuits in Go. And this library comes with a, a library that you can use directly for highly uh, efficient. Uh, cryptographic functions that you can call directly around curves, pairings, and so on. So this is something that we do as well. And we have a lot of activity on rollups uh, about mm -hmm. the scalability, where we have a team working on the arithmetization and a team working on the prover part of the rollups. So that's what we're doing in R&D. Uh, on myself, uh, I come from distributed systems. I did a master on networking and distributed systems uh, quite a while ago. I even work on financial systems. And then on big data systems, I contributed a lot of code to Hadoop and big data for people who are mm. old enough to, to know what it is. Uh, and I joined Consensus at the very beginning of 2018 to participate wow. to about Ethereum 2, how it was called like this. And we identified very quickly that rollups were the solution for scalability from basically I'm working on rollups since the beginning of 2019, as we believed that it was the the solution. I see. It sounds amazing. I I can um I can sense that you have a lot of experience in like applied crypto and also distributed system, right? And uh, can you like use some simple words to ex explain what's zero knowledge uh, proof and why we need zero knowledge like for scaling Ethereum? Yes. So, I mean, this zero technology is a kind of magic thing, which is you can prove that you know something and you don't have to reveal it. And simple example is uh, you can show that you know the pre-image of a hash, like uh, why you have a function y equals hash to x of x. And you say, oh, I can prove that I know x, but I won't reveal x. Okay, that's a, that's a nice toy. And actually, for a while, everybody thought, okay, it's a toy that it never be used. But uh, from this, actually, you can prove a pre image of a hash, but you can prove that you know a Merkle pass. Uh, if you could know, if you can prove that you know a Merkle pass, you can actually prove that you know a state. And if you can prove that you know a state, you can prove that you know uh, about a state change. 
and actually multiple state changes. And we can prove as well that a state change was driven by the content of another part of a state that we can prove as well. And this other part of a state is basically a problem. So from this small tool, which is I can, I can prove that I know something, you can prove actually execution just by building on it. And by itself, it seems a little bit useless, but the point is the schemes that we have for zero knowledge uh, have some very interesting properties. And the, this thing that we call SNARK, uh, the S stands for succinct, which means that the proof is actually very small and can actually be constant size of a few hundreds of bytes for some schemes. That's a very good feature because you can prove something that is very big with a, a very small state. So maybe the state, it's 10 gigabytes of data. The statement is going to be 100 bytes. Uh, second thing is still on Stark. The N stands for non-interactive. It means that you can verify the state asynchronously without having to discuss, to speak to the prover part. Okay, it's, You receive a proof and alone you're going to verify the proof without having to connect to any piece of software. The proof will stand forever. Okay, so what we're saying is you can prove a complicated execution that will require uh, possibly gigabytes of data uh, in basically a few milliseconds on an isolated computer uh, with a proof size of 100 bytes. Uh, and the point of this is linked to Ethereum. I mean, you had this story uh, basically five years ago, actually, when I joined, people were saying, oh, I'm going to deliver a faster Ethereum uh, because I've got a faster consensus protocol. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, oh, my fast consensus protocol is so fast. Yeah, okay, it's so fast. But the point of Ethereum, the, the critical pain point, actually, for the, for the speed is not the consensus. It's the execution part, the fact that the state is very big and the fact that as we don't trust the miner, we are going to re-execute the transactions in order to check that the execution is correct. And you just take this uh, proof instead of re-executing all the transactions and you don't need the state anymore and re verifying the correctness of the execution takes verifying this proof in a few milliseconds rather than uh, receiving gigabytes of data and re-executing all the transactions one by one. So that's why it's quite key. Uh, we can basically solve the scalability problem of Ethereum if we can replace the re-execution by the verification of a proof. Yeah, I got it. Like, so in DevCon, right, I know your team basically talk about the ZK EVM work uh, consensus, right? Can you share a little bit like, about the definition of ZK EVM in your opinion? And meanwhile, like what, what kind of the current progress of the ZK EVM project in your team? Yeah, so we have, a, I would say, a, a strict definition of a ZK EVM, which is a mm -hmm. ZK EVM is a ZK EVM that takes wow. as input uh, EVM bytecode natively. Uh, and it means with this definition that you can reuse existing bytecode, existing tools, and it's going to work. And uh, that's, that's really the, uh, the good definition of a ZKVM. Now you, you've got some pain points, like you put Ketchak, and Ketchak is used all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ethereum, if you take the layer paper, you have the opcode Ketchak, but as well, uh, the block itself is calculated with the hash, uh, and the block hash function, and the state, is represented with a Patricia Merkel tree that is using Ketchak all over the place. So if we want to take the full yellow paper, we should represent the state with Ketchak. And uh, and that's it. We have performance issues when we do that. Nobody has found a way so far to have a, a good proving type with Ketchak. So we do have what Vitalik calls a type 2 ZKVM, which mm -hmm. is the state is represented differently. Uh, and the only reason for this is performances. And in this, when you do this, you basically have a different hash function and a slightly different state representation. I still consider this as a ZKVM uh, because the change is mostly invisible for a smart contract. There's a few things that will leak, but it's mostly invisible. 
Uh, I still think, however, that in the future, the L1 and the L2 will be able to represent the state in the same way. And there are some work in progress at the Ethereum Foundation in order to change the state representation. Uh, so in the future, uh, we will have just uh, type 1 ZKVMs. Uh, a key point of this definition, and basically why we need this definition, is uh, the link to decentralization. The fact that we have exactly the same specification as the layer 1 specification, and that you can have multiple independent ZKVM representing uh, the bytecode using exactly the same bytecodes means for a smart contract developer that you can move from uh, the layer from one layer two to another layer two, and that you can move from the layer two to the layer one if you're not happy at a point. But as well, uh, and we're coming from this Ethereum uh, two world, is you can take the layer one smart contracts and you can move them to the layer two, uh, so you will have this scalability improvement. Uh, without having to do an audit uh, or new bugs or new things like this. So that's why we think that the ZKVM in, uh, I would say, type 1 or type 2 are very important for uh, the scalability of Ethereum and then for the decentralization because you can have multiple providers. I see. And uh, yeah, I think this definition is very useful and helpful for us to understand these, um, like the difference across different projects, right? And at the same time, can you share a little bit about the current progress uh, about the implementation or also about the design uh, on your team for this uh, UK, uh, ZK EVM development part? Yeah. So when you build uh, a ZK EVM, you have a quite a lot of challenges. And at the yeah. end of the day, uh, they're going to be very summarized in a single challenge. Uh, you basically have two components. Uh, you've got this arithmetization, which is uh, transforming the EVM specification in the yellow paper into a set of constraints on execution traces. Okay, the logic is you have execution generates traces, and we can prove that the only valid traces will correspond to the execution of a smart contract that you asked for. And this is incredibly complicated because the EVM is complicated. Uh, historically, it has been complicated. There are many things that are a little bit strange. And it's very complicated as well because you want it to work in a ZK logic, which adds a lot of complexity. Uh, so that's the first component. The second component is the prover. Well, you need to, the prover is going to prove that the constraints are satisfied. So you don't need to run the, you don't need to receive the execution traces and to run the constraints mm -hmm. by yourself. You have a proof. I have the traces and the traces are satisfying the constraints. So you, the proof is enough, uh, to prove the correctness of execution. And this is, as well complicated. But, but the main point, it's really about being fast. Uh, because if you can, you can write a perfect arithmetization and a perfect prover, but if you need 10 minutes to prove a single transaction, you're not exactly solving the scalability problem with this. And you can say, yeah, we can have uh, thousands or thousands of computers, but okay, it's just going to be incredibly expensive. And that's where the challenge is. The challenge is to solve those two problems in uh, a very efficient way. Uh, to us, a reasonable target is to be at the beginning at 50 TPS uh, on a 100 core machine. You have a 100 core machine to generate the proof, and you can do that mm -hmm. like a L1 block in uh, 12 seconds. That's our target. We're not exactly there, but we think that we'll be there. Uh, that's something that we uh, that we want to achieve, and we want to achieve more than this as well. That's uh, that's the first point. Uh, so we published actually a specification of arithmetization a year ago, which uh, was 50 pages around something like this. We published a new specification just before DevCon. It's 250 pages now. The arithmetization I think will be finished. It will be have around 300 pages, and it's really. It contains everything. It contains it contains everything about the arithmetization. It says it describes the whole arithmetization 
and why it is done like this. So we have an explanation of why we did this type of choices. So it's probably something that I encourage people to have a look at. Uh, basically, if you find a bug here, it's uh, it's critical. So we found a few bugs since the publication. So there are a few issues there. We found some improvements as well. Uh, so obviously, we publish a new uh, and updated specification. Uh, but it's really something in terms of status that we think is important to have this shared specification that everybody can read. Okay, so it's again it's 250 pages, so it's not exactly uh, a 10 minutes uh, 10 minutes work, uh, but it's there. I think it's quite important that it's there. Uh, and the prover, we're going to publish a paper soon with the ideas that we have around uh, how to get a fast prover. So there are new things that are not done externally. I mean, I've never seen them mentioned in the term world. And uh, so it should be interesting for everybody. It's a matter of death. Uh, could have nearly been done for this podcast, but it's just a little bit late. Uh, and that's the two components. And then we will build from this and we'll improve things. Uh, all this will be visible in the test net. Uh, we announced it at DEF CON, actually. We had a form yeah. that was closed and we're going to reopen it again soon. Uh, and the idea of a testnet is uh, you can deploy protocols, you can deploy smart contracts, you can call uh, whatever you want. And so it's uh, I encourage people as well to have a look at it and they can deploy the code they want to deploy. Uh, we won't be at 100% coverage. Uh, we will have something, we, for example, we don't have a pre-compiles yet. It's something that will come later. Uh, but we actually have a quite big piece of uh, the system. So it should be uh, quite interesting to see. Yeah, sounds great. I, and I think, like, as you mentioned, right, for the a few hundred pages of uh, of the like sort of uh, specifications, uh, definitely can be the standard for a lot of these um, uh, zk EVM implementations. I mean, well, I think people are very excited about the testnet, and especially later on if we reopen it again. And uh, I think definitely there will be a, a lot of like community members who would like to participate in the test night and try out what's like sort of the ZK EVM uh, like, you know. And uh, yeah, on the other side, as you know, right, uh, for uh, for the like for any of these uh, ZK proof like sort of protocols, we always need uh, sort of provers to generate uh, like to generate uh, the uh, the ZK proofs, right? Um, like in your opinion, do you think like decentralization is also very important for ZK EVM? And meanwhile, how you feel like we can decentralize the pro uh, provers in the near future? Yeah. So I mean, decentralization is key. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't care about decentralization, if you're happy with a centralized system, uh, you can run a system on Amazon uh, and find. Just do that. So if you're using this type of system, it means that decentralization is important. And if you run a centralized system, again, that's fine if you're what you need. But in our world, it means basically calling for FTX to happen again. Uh, we should not have trusted FTX. And if we trust centralized uh, ZK VMs or ZK whatever, uh, we will have exactly the same thing. Um, we should not trust basically EVM operators, including ourselves. Uh, and the key point to me, it's really related to speed. That's why I'm really insisting on this point is people were using FTX because, well, if you want something that is cheap and fast, you need this type of centralized solutions to them. So centralization is decentralization is key, but in order to get it, we need to have very fast prover and very cheap provers, all of this. And then people, it will always be a little bit more expensive than using a single server on a single Amazon instance. Yes, but it should be cheap enough so people can, without sacrificing too much financial money, uh, use this type of system. So I, I think decentralization to me, it's really about being efficient and being fast. And Vitalik mentioned a target of five cents per transaction. I think it's a, it's a good target. That's where we should go in uh, as soon as I possible. See. Five cents for yeah. complicated transactions, not five cents for just a transfer. Basically, you can call Uniswap, SushiSwap, 
uh, are with basically five cents. That, that should be the target. And, and you still want to decentralize the prover and the sequencer. I mean, uh, I fully agree. Uh, and we need both, actually, not only the prover. I think the sequencer, it's important so anyone can force the inclusion of a transaction. Uh, not only uh, propose a transaction, but say, okay, you're going to execute this. So that's basically decentralized sequencer, having multiple sequencers without any limitation to entry. I think it's something very important. And it's exactly the same thing for the prover. Anyone should be able to run a prover and to get uh, some fees out of this. Uh, it's not actually that difficult. There are multiple different ways of doing this. And the hard part is actually when you want to split the sequencer and the prover, how are you going to share the fees? And uh, if you let one decide, the other will have nothing. So you basically want to create a kind of market saying, mm -hmm. if I execute this, this, uh, this, uh, this batch of transactions, I'm getting this amount of fees. And this is possible, but it becomes a little bit complicated. You don't want uh, to organize the, a market that will take 10 minutes to, uh, to reach the optimal to uh, just to decide on the price for one batch. You need something a little bit uh, more efficient than this. So that's where the pain point is. Uh, but I think it's, I see it more as an optimization issue than a real issue. Like we just can open the system. So we, the first proof is accepted and, uh, and the fees won't be perfect, but it may be good enough for a while. And it's something that can be done in the future. So I think that now that we have made a lot of progress on provers, uh, separating the prover is going to be, uh, uh, and the sequencer is going to be the, the next agreement point uh, should happen in the next uh, quarters, I expect. Yeah, I see. So um, as you just mentioned, right, we can set up some marketplace like the provers uh, to generate uh, sort of the proofs, right? And uh, um, like, are there any other potential ways to also speed up like sort of the ZK proof generation? Yeah, so I mean, there are so many ways in a way. Can try to use hardware, GPUs, FPGA, mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of obvious solution. Um, we should not forget that the, the arithmetization has an impact of the performances. If you do a bad arithmetization, basically you will have too many things to check, to check, and it will be incredibly complicated as well. So your know, arithmetization is really uh, a point that should be taken into account, and as well the scheme itself. Uh, we're doing complicated things. We're precompiles are one of them. And having an optimal scheme is something that has actually value. So the way I see it, there's still a lot of work to do on arithmetization, on proving scheme itself. And then we can target the hardware, uh, FPGA being uh, a reasonable solution. But I will say on my end, I'm not sure when we'll see, okay, now we have done all we could on the scheme. We really need to go on FPGA. I'm sure that we're not there yet. Maybe we'll be there in one year. Mm. I don't know. Maybe one year to four years, I would say. But that's really this gap. Uh, the improvements that we can do at the scheme level are quite huge. I think it's quite important to see this. And it's interesting to have a global view because the arithmetization impacts the prover which impacts uh, the scheme, which impacts basically the hardware implementation. You really have a all these dimensions, and having a global understanding is actually important as well. There are some things that are easy to implement on hardware, but you can't really have them efficiently. It's complicated to have in the prover, for example. So you want to uh, you want to select the scheme that will go well on the hardware as well. Yeah, so that fine. will be the challenge for next year. That's how I see it. Yeah, got it. So at the same time, right? Uh, like during the DevCon, Vitaly also mentioned that uh, it's quite tough to have some bug-free ZK rollup implementations um, because, as in, you know, right? Just for a few lines of code for the proof, probably we can have over uh, thirty thousand line, uh, lines of the circuit circuits like sort of code, um, like. In your opinion, what, what are the measures we can apply to reduce or eliminate these bugs? I mean, 
probably existing in the ZK rollup implementations. Yeah, so I mean, Vitalik is totally right. Uh, and it's not only the implementation, it's as well the specification. I mean, mm -hmm. again, uh, our specification is 300 pages. There's no way that we don't have bugs there. I mean, it's just impossible. And it's even worse than this is even if it's audited, and we are, we are very happy about, very proud of the specification, we've done our best, but okay, there will be some miss, misses and the audit won't prove that the specification is bug free. It will help, it will likely find bugs, but we will have bugs there. So audits are useful, but for something as complicated, it's not enough. Uh, we do have other tools, like, for example, we run the reference unit test as well of the EVM. I mean, we, the fact that it's a ZK EVM means that we can reuse a lot of existing contents. So we're running a, a reference unit test. We're running on mainnet as well. So we're trying to prove uh, all the mainnet uh, blocks. Uh, but this does not prove that we can't create a, a fake proof. Uh, we prove that we can create proofs for everything, but we're not proving that you can't create a fake proof, which is an incredibly big issue. Uh, formal verification should help, and I do expect that it will help to make a, a difference as well. And we do have teams working on this at Consensus, so uh, uh, they will definitely help us. And we will still have the implementation issues, and even with formal verification, I think with mm. a few properties won't be verified. So that's why I mean Vitalik's solution, which is you need multiple provers. I think it's a very, yeah. very good solution. Uh, to me, uh, that's the solution. And it's interesting because it means that the teams should have different arithmetization, different provers, potentially different hardwares. But at the end of the day, uh, if we want to change the state of the rollup, we need multiple proofs from those multiple implementation. And with this great idea, uh, that you even, you don't need all of them, but a super majority would be useful. Like if you can have a proof, uh, you have four systems and three of them are uh, validating the update with a proof, then you can move on. I think it's a very, very good solution. So it solves a lot of points. It solves a lot of points as well because uh, issues with audits and careful reading and uh, a time proven technologies is that what happens if you change something like you need to make it a little bit faster, you need to add an opcode, uh, your audit is not valid anymore. So even if you do, if you did a lot of work in the past, uh, that's not useful. Why, if you have multiple systems running concurrently to prove the same rollup, uh, you really need a bug to be in all the provers in order to have a big issue. So it's not only it makes the system safer, it makes also the system easier to change. You don't need any more to do a six months audit after each change or to say something like, okay, trust me, the audit is two years old and I've done uh, 2000 changes, but uh, we think it's fine. It's, it cannot be fine with something that's complicated. So it's really the solution. So to me, if we want to be able to have a flexible system, uh, that is safe, that's where we should go. And I think that's our responsibility as roll-up uh, ZKVM implementers to get basically this done. Uh, it's not simple. Uh, typically, as explaining the state, we don't have the same state representation uh, between all the ZKVMs. And here, we more or less need to have an agreement. Uh, so there's some stuff to be done. Uh, but I think it should be done, and we will try to to get it done as much as we can. That's uh, I would say the way we want to uh, to make the system better. Yeah, I believe so. Like basically, you are the expert, I be, uh, in the like formal uh, verification, and also being in this space for a long time. I believe on your side, definitely, you will apply a bunch of these measures to try to figure out these bugs and fix uh, these bugs, right? And uh, yeah, uh, on the other side, like what are the remaining uh, sort of open problems for ZK EVM? And uh, like how can researchers or developers like us help you guys to solve these issues? Okay, so I think we have one big issue and, uh, and multiple small ones. Um, mm -hmm. 
Typically, I mean, getting 100% coverage of the EVM opcode is difficult. Uh, and when you run the unit test, uh, you usually see that it's not exactly like you wanted it to be. Uh, at this point on our end, we have no errors actually on the reference suite. Uh, and we're quite proud of it and it took us quite a lot of time to get there. Uh, we don't have yet 100% coverage, so we still have a few things to do, but on everything that we have done so far, uh, we're fully compliant. So I think it's not an open problem anymore. It's something complicated, but not uh, open anymore. I think uh, the real stuff, it's really the performances and how to get good performances. Again, to me, mm -hmm. we should be able to prove one layer, one batch in one second on a reasonable hardware. That's really where we should be. And there are many things to do there. Uh, how can you have faster pre-compiles? Uh, how much data do you need to do this? Uh, that's a lot of cryptographic oriented problems. And the second problem, which is still open, is how can we have type 1 ZK EVMs, again, at a reasonable hardware cost? And we know that there will be some changes in the L1 specifications. Uh, and we need to get them right. We need to be sure that the changes will allow us to have uh, this fast uh, layer two implementation. Yeah, a lot of that's, new uh, EIPs. Yeah. Exactly. And it's going to, I mean, as we need to get it right, uh, we don't want to break the layer one to have a better layer two. And uh, the layer one people won't let us do it, which is very good. Uh, so it's going to take time to find the solution. So that's why we need to find the right solution and to be sure that we're not missing anything. Uh, because uh, that's the key point to to have a, a fully decentralized system. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And meanwhile, to the last question, right? So as you know, we are doing this um, like alternative views. Like, do you have any like sort of non-mainstream advice for our audience? Yeah, I do have one. I think it's uh, kind of a don't trust verify. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's not mainstream uh, at this point. I mean, we saw that with FTX. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's what we should be doing for this uh, for this system as well. Uh, we're building a system. There's a circuit. Don't trust it. Verify you have a specification. Um... That's uh, don't trust that as a single operator we are the only one to be able to update the system and we won't do anything bad. I think it's don't trust us on that. The system should allow uh, anyone to submit a proof. And should in a trustable way. Uh, that's how uh, that's yeah, how I yeah. see it. Yeah, especially for us, right? We're building some like sort of brand new technologies, right? And uh, basically, we I think the only way for us to uh, to trust is really to do the verification like on some new technologies. Yeah, I see there's uh, no much reference we can really refer to. Yeah, exactly. that. that yeah, thanks a lot, Nicholas. Uh, I believe it's a really like great conversation with you. And uh, yeah, to the audience, right? Uh, uh, thanks for your listening. And uh, as you know, our, our views basically we are uh, inviting all the like, sort of um, industry leaders and uh, especially the technical leaders to share about the industry and also layer two scalability topics. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. And uh, we sort of uh, signing off to the next time.